That's Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, which can be found on page 1179. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now, I love listening to uh, the prayers of older Christians uh, to give me thoughts on what I can pray. It's wonderful uh, to be able to listen to what other people who've gone before us, those who've been Christians for a bit longer, uh, to hear what they pray. It's why I love this book, The Valley of Vision, uh, prayers inspired by Puritans hundreds of years ago, and I love dipping into that to hear a bit more. It's why I love at the church family prayer meeting that we have every month, sitting with those I don't know very well. I often sit with those I do know, uh, but occasionally I'll sit with those I don't know so well who've been Christian for a bit longer, and it's wonderful to hear uh, the encouragement of their prayers, uh, the things they choose to pray for. But imagine instead that you could sit with the Apostle Paul and listen to him pray. Uh, To listen to someone with such a commitment to prayer, such a a knowledge of the scriptures. Most importantly, to listen to the apostle to the nations, God's man commissioned to bring us the gospel, to listen to him pray. Wouldn't you like to listen to that? Wouldn't you like to know what he prays for you? Of course, tonight we're actually doing more than that. You might realize where that's going. That's what we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so doing. But we're doing more than that because tonight and throughout this series, we're creeping into the prison cell of the Apostle Paul, squinting through the candlelight as he picks up a pen and writes to the church in Philippi. Most likely we're around the time of the end of the book of Acts, Uh, At the end of the letter, Paul tells us about Caesar's household. We discover that he's in the charge of the imperial guard. So most likely, uh, he is currently in prison, as we read about in Acts chapter 28. And like the readers at the end of Acts, Paul doesn't know what the next step is. But there's a very real possibility that he might die. Uh, Just flick over the page and look at chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 20, top of the page there, he says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So both life and death, they're real possibilities for Paul at the moment. In fact, chapter 2, verse 17 pushes it further just across the page there. 2, verse 17, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, As you see, he envisages the idea that he might be poured out as an offering. It's an image of him giving up his life and sacrifice. And chapter 2, verse 23 says he hopes to send Timothy, great guy Timothy, uh, Timothy just as soon as I see how it will go with me, he says. He doesn't know how it's going to go. And although he's optimistic that he might survive, we in fact know that he did go on to survive. At the time that he's writing this letter, it is as a prisoner on death row. And he decides to get in touch with the Philippians, a church of key supporters. The Philippians, who we discover at the end of the letter, were the first church to partner with him financially. The Philippians, they were key partners in the work. And so if he were to die... They were the best bet for continuing mission in the years to come. It's as though Paul is staring death in the face, and he decides to get in touch with his key partners in order to pass on to them the baton of the gospel. We've called this series Passing on the Baton. 
to share with them some final words before he goes. And his letter begins with his prayer for them. Wouldn't you like to listen to what he has to pray? This man on death row to eavesdrop on what he wants for the Philippians, to hear what God's apostle for the nations wants for the church after he's gone, to hear ultimately what God wants for us in these days after Paul, what God wants for you. It's a bold prayer, a dangerous prayer in some ways. It's the sort of prayer that might shape not just what you pray, but what you do for the rest of your life. It is a great prayer for us to spend the next few minutes looking at together. And it starts, as with so many of Paul's prayers, with thanksgiving. Specifically, thanksgiving that things are going well. A point one there on the handout, I think we're still about there. If things are going well. Let's turn back to chapter one, verse three, and let me pick up from there. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I guess we're at that time of year where lots of people are having performance reviews. If you did, I don't know how yours went, but wouldn't it be great to get a review like this? Many have suggested different problems that are being faced by the church in Philippi, but I'm not really convinced that there were that many that they were currently in the midst of. No great heresy uh, that they were themselves believing in. Even the suggestion that there was a problem with division, I think, isn't as big a problem as people have suggested. Rather, this is a church where things are going really well. So well, in fact, that Paul is constantly filled with thanksgiving for them. Indeed, he is able to say with great confidence, verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I know you're going to make it, says Paul. Or perhaps more accurately, I know God will keep you. He will get you to the end. And you don't have to be a Christian for very long to know that that isn't true of everybody. Some people fall away. Paul's own ministry is characterized by those who fall by the wayside. So why is he so confident for the Philippians? Well, verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Paul is confident for them because of their partnership. And not that their partnership has won them salvation, as though Paul were confident that they had done enough good to get into heaven. Far from it. None of us have. No, it is by faith that we're saved, trusting in Jesus' death on our behalf alone. But their partnership is a sign of the work that God has begun in them. Paul can see in the way that they've been behaving that God has made them real believers. They're not fair weather Christians, you know, those who are kind of committed to Christianity when the weather is fine and prospects are good, but who run a mile when it's unfashionable or when it gets you into trouble. No, verse 7 says that they are partakers with him of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And so they've been partnering with him. They've supported him. They've got their wallets out for him. When he was defending the gospel, even when gospel proclamation got him, well, thrown into prison, they were still ready to throw their money behind him. Can you imagine the headlines? Church exposed as major donor for death row criminal. This is the church exposed by that headline. Such was their commitment to the Lord Jesus that they were willing, eager. That is the sort of partnership that only God can bring about. And Paul is sure that God who began a good work in them will bring it to completion at the end. Paul's not writing to this church because there's a big problem there, but because things are going well, because there's so much for which to be thankful, because they're a kind of flagship church to which he can pass on the gospel baton. And so as he's praying for them, before he gets round to what he wants for them, he starts with thanksgiving. He starts by praising God for what God has already done in them. And he tells the Philippians too, so that they can start by thanking God. 
It's easy, isn't it, to focus on the ways that we need to change, to dwell on our failings rather than our successes, to picture God as a hard taskmaster who's only ever disappointed in us. But Paul's prayer begins with thanksgiving, with commendation, with a smile. And in that, doesn't he reflect the smile of God? God's commendation of their partnership. Not that they can take the credit. Uh, No, it is God who has accomplished this in them. And that's why Paul's thanksgiving is directed to God. But even as it would be wrong to take the credit for God's work, it's also wrong to ignore the good work that God has done. Now, let me ask you, how often do you reflect on what God has done in your life? How often do you praise him for what he has already worked in you? Now, this week, I went to go and visit a friend who became a Christian about a year ago, and he was reflecting on how God had worked in his life over the last 12 months, and it was a huge encouragement, something for which we were able to give praise to God together, even as it would be wrong to take credit for God's work. Isn't it also wrong to ignore the good work that God has done? Let's praise him for it. Of course, as some of us review the last year or so, we might reflect that there is actually a big difference between us and the Philippians. This isn't Paul's review of every church he writes to. I guess it wouldn't be his review of all of us. If you're a Christian at all, let's be clear, there are things that God has done in your life which are worth praising him for. Even the fact you are a Christian Praise him for that. What a miracle he's done. But I guess some of us might be taking God's salvation for granted. If our lives have no expressions of partnership in the gospel, well, then Paul couldn't pray the same prayer quite for us, could he? And yet these verses aren't a rebuke. That's not how Paul writes them. They are a commendation of this sort of partnership. They tell us how good it is to partner in the gospel, even to side with those who are persecuted for it. They tell us it's a sign of God's great work. And so if there is a gap between us and the Philippians, and if you're anything like me, I guess that's most of us here, well, let's pray that gap would shrink. That however well things are going, we might not settle, but but improve. That we'd grow, that we'd partner more. In fact, even while the Philippians are getting on well, that same pursuit of growth is what Paul prays for them. We're on to point two. Uh, Even if things are going well, think better. Uh, Think better. Uh, My phone is a OnePlus phone. Uh, Most of you have never heard of that phone brand, but it's important for this next brief illustration. OnePlus uh, is a phone brand, and they've got the tagline, never settle. Uh, The idea is, you know, don't, don't settle for good enough. Go for the best. I think it's a bit ironic because they're not the best phones in the world. (laughs) Like if people listened to that tagline, they'd go out of business. But it's a great tagline for Paul. Never settle. That's what he's praying for the Philippians, verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Things are going well, Paul says, and it would be easy, wouldn't it, to think, well, great, then I'll coast. We spent the whole evening thinking about God's wonderful preservation of his people. It would be easy for us to think, great, I'll leave things as they are. And Paul wants them to never settle. Specifically, he wants them to love more. And no, he doesn't tie down that love to a particular kind of love, love of God or love of one another. I think it's both. It's all. It's all encompassing. Their love may abound more and more. Even as the Philippians have already demonstrated a great love for Jesus and for Paul in their partnership so far, he wants the Philippians to be even more characterized by love. And yet I could have called this point love better. Even if things are going well, love better. But I've gone for the heading, think better, because Paul says more than just love more. His prayer is for their love to abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. He doesn't just want them to change the way they feel. He wants them to change the way they think. The commentaries love talking about the particular meanings of those words. Knowledge seems to have a particular moral component. It is, as we'll see in a few weeks, particularly, I think, a knowledge of God. 
And discernment carries the sense of insight, the ability to take that knowledge to real life situations and respond rightly. But whatever knowledge and discernment are about, the big idea is one of thinking. Paul wants them to change the way they think. He prays that their love would abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Never settle. Think better. And that's key because thinking and mindset will be huge in the rest of the book. There's a word for mind or thinking which Paul uses in this short letter more than in any other letter. In fact, about half of the times he uses that word are all in this short book. There is a mindset which Paul wants for them. Like every one of Paul's letters, his prayer at the start is a kind of trailer for what's coming next. And here is a trailer for the idea of transforming our thinking, a loving mindset. Never settle. Think better. And we don't get that much more on the mindset yet. Just that it's a loving mindset shaped by knowledge and discernment. Love shaped by our right knowledge of God and the world that we live in. Paul's going to say lots more in the weeks to come. If this talk is successful, you'll be really annoyed that I haven't said more about what's coming. You'll have to come back next week. But hopefully it's something that you'll want. Because that's what Paul goes on to talk about for the rest of the prayer. Reasons why you might want this change of thinking. And primarily, it's because of the transformation it brings about. It will lead to making better decisions. Verse 9, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. If they abound in love with knowledge and discernment, if they have this right mindset, then they'll be able to make the best choices. They'll be able to spot the things that are better than all the rest. They'll be able to approve what is excellent. I'm aware at this point that we need an illustration. And so I brought in some chocolate. Can I have a volunteer from the front row? Thank you, Paul. Great. Okay. Are you allergic to anything? Good. Right. I don't think I'm going to throw this very successfully, but good. Okay. Can you try that for us? Uh, that at the moment, right now, uh, this, is, this is supposed to be a quick illustration. Just take a bit. Don't like eat the whole thing. Uh, this is Lidl's Simply Range chocolate. Now, lots of us know Lidl is the kind of budget supermarket. Who knew that they even had a budget range chocolate? Uh, but this is what they've got. How is that? How's that chocolate? Great. That's a small problem for illustrating this, but that's all right. Um, now I've got some Hotel Chocolat chocolate. Oh, yeah, see, you know. <laughs> okay, do you want to try that for us? Now, this is literally 10 times the price. In fact, more than 10 times the price. So I'll tell you what, if this illustration fails, we all know where to get our chocolate from. <laughs> Just try that for us. How's that? Yeah, it's better. There you go. <laughs> A very discerning palette there from Paul. <laughs> it's confusing now because Paul, I'm going to, when I speak about Paul for the rest of this talk, <laughs> Paul the Apostle wants us to make discerning decisions, to be able to identify what surpasses all others and to choose it, to choose, if you like, the hotel chocolat of life. But of course, he's got no interest in chocolate. His interest is in choosing the things that really are excellent. He wants them to make choices ultimately, which will honor God. Look at verse 9 again. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. With the right mindset, says Paul, you will be able to make excellent decisions. Decisions that lead to growth in godliness. Decisions that transform us more and more into the likeness of Jesus. To produce, as he puts it here, the fruit of righteousness. Uh, Paul pictures us like farmers, fruit farmers, and we're working out how to make the best, how to get the best crop. But naturally, we're pretty poor at getting the best out of the field. So many of our decisions work against the fruitfulness of the field, against our purity, our blamelessness. I wonder, is that as true of you as it is of me? And so Paul prays, however well things are going, even when they're going really well, that we'd never settle, but that we'd think better. Because as God shapes our thinking to make excellent decisions, 
while the field yields an abundant harvest. And no mere apples or pears or cocoa, but purity, blamelessness, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. An excellent life made of excellent decisions. If only we were to think better. Remember, Paul is not praying this in order that they might be saved. He has already said that he is sure that he who began a good work in them will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Their salvation is not dependent on their performance. If you're here looking in on the claims of Jesus, please let me say this very clearly. None of us will be saved by, because of what we have done. We are saved only by trusting in what Christ has done. Now, this isn't about being saved. It's about, well, if you like, living the excellent life. It is about being transformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. About being so shaped by the gospel that we are found on that day pure and blameless to God's praise and glory. And picture a group who are so transformed like this, whose love abounds so much that they always choose what serves others. A picture a group who know God so well that they reflect his character in the way that they interact with outsiders. Always gracious and compassionate and patient. And whose discernment is so great that they can see in any and every situation the best way of serving others. Have you ever hung around people like that? People who make you feel welcome and safe and loved. People who in some undefinable way remind you of the Lord Jesus as he's revealed in the gospel. Isn't that the sort of group that you want to hang out with? Isn't that the sort of person you want to be? For some of us, the answer is no. We don't want to be like that. I wonder, were you thinking that? And we'd love for other people to be like that. <laughs> but it all sounds a bit too keen, a bit too much like hard work. We're happy to settle. We want to settle. We're happy with just a passing grade. Can't I just stay as I am? Don Carson's little book on Philippians, Basics for Believers, begins with that sentiment. I would like to buy about three quid's worth of gospel, please. Not too much, just enough to make me happy, but not so much that I get addicted. I don't want so much... Gospel that I learn to really hate covetousness and lust. I certainly don't want so much that I start to love my enemies or cherish self-denial and contemplate missionary service in some alien culture. I want ecstasy, not repentance. I want transcendence, not transformation. I would like to be cherished by some nice, forgiving, broad-minded people, but I myself don't want to love those from different races. I would like enough gospel to make my family secure and my children well-behaved, but not so much that I find my ambitions redirected or my giving too greatly enlarged. I'd like about three quid's worth of gospel, please. wonder, does that sound familiar? And the reason we want to settle for three quid worth of gospel is because we believe that the full life and the fully committed life are two different things. That the fully committed life is working against our joy. That we'll get more out of life if we're not too keen for Christ. That we should settle for a passing grade. But when we choose to settle, we are choosing, if you like, the little economy brand chocolates. In fact, it's worse than that. Paul, later on in the book, likens it, I think, to dung. So... Paul, you ready? Make sure you catch this. I mean, obviously, I don't throw dung around St. Helens. That is chocolate mixed with cream. Like, it should be quite nice. You can decide to eat it or not. But the fact you were all horrified and Beck was really worried for a second then. Is that all right? It's not hotel chocolate, but there you go. The fact you were horrified says everything, doesn't it? Nobody chooses dung. And yet so often, that's what we choose. We even sometimes envy those who choose dung, the lesser option. We want enough of the gospel to make us happy, but not too much. Not too much excellence, please. Just about three quid's worth. 
while the God-honoring life, the, the excellent life, is sitting right there, ready to be grasped. Don't we want to be able to make the excellent decision? Don't we want to be able to tell the difference? Well, we've not yet been told how all of it will work. There is a lot more for the apostle to tell us in this letter. But for now, well, it is what he prays for. And it is a bold prayer. A dangerous prayer, even. A prayer that, that our whole lives would change. That however well things have been going, that we would think better. It is a fitting prayer for God's man on death row to pray for a church of key partners. The question is, is it a prayer that you are willing to pray? I wonder, is it a prayer that you are ready to pray for yourself? Don't pray it if you want to stay as you are. Don't pray it if you want to settle. But if you want to approve what is excellent, if you want to make the very best decisions in your life, if you want to make those uh, approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless on the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God, you, like me, are going to need a lot of help. And it is a great thing then to pray this. I get excited. Philippians has lots to say to help us to that end. But it begins with a prayer. So why don't I lead us in praying it together? Our Father in heaven, we praise you for all that you have already done in us. Thank you for the wonderful examples of partnership reflected in this room. Thank you for your grace that you have done such a work in so many. And we pray that in all of us, you would cause our love to abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. We pray, our Father, that in this series, you'd help us to understand what that means and so that we would approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for that glorious day when Jesus returns, that we'd be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus to your praise and glory. And we ask it in his name. Amen.